Hello, so my name is Alessandra Fogli and I'm a monetary advisor here at the Minneapolis Fed and uh, assistant director for research on inequality with the Institute. Initially, uh, I was going to talk about how important it is uh, to look at these dimensions of the business cycle because um, during times that the economy is tight, uh, gaps that are faced particularly by black workers shrink. Uh, when you look at the unemployment rate for blacks who have associate degrees compared to white high school dropouts, during most economic times, blacks who have an associate degrees actually are worse in terms of unemployment than white high school dropouts. But when the labor market tightens, you get a closer uh, unemployment rate between black associate degree holders and white high school graduates. Um, and so th that's important to do. The Fed. Uh, and, you know, it helps have diversity uh, in the FOMC and people at the meetings. Um, Neil has been uh, an advocate for the mandate of maximum employment. And I was going to say, you know, this is really wonderful, except uh, in the last four months, the black labor market has turned decidedly to the worse. Uh, so I changed my topic. So, <laughs> um, and, and, and it's not because of... Well, it may be because of the Fed, actually, but uh, I, I thought something else was more important. So, um, so I'm going to give some remarks on the panel we just saw, uh, but I also want to, to, to push uh, or presage uh, the, what I hope would be the next conference. So, uh, again, I think this has been a wonderful um, effort. Uh, in the previous panel, we saw how safety nets do or do not respond to the business cycle. Um, what was missing was the perverse uh, pattern of unemployment insurance. Well, unemployment is, uh, and you know, you saw great evidence, is, is something that seems to be a good cyclical thing. The, the problem is that uh, state unemployment insurance funds go bankrupt during downturns, and then they turn because they very quickly have to get money back into their system. So before the system actually uh, gets to finish being uh, healthy again, they already figure out how do we get the money back so our trust funds can be built up. And we've seen that from the 80 downturn, and we saw that from the 1980s downturn, and we saw that this time. Uh, and the response is, we will keep people from getting unemployment insurance. So now we have nine states where Maximum duration is less than 26 weeks. Uh, the size of benefits have been shrunk. Um, states have decided they just won't run up uh, huge expenditures on unemployment insurance, and that's how they'll balance their budgets. So um, there's that element we, we didn't get to see in the previous panel, uh, and was, but the panel was important for you know explaining to us how AFDC uh, transformation to TANF has made that very important safety net, not very helpful. Um, and then we heard a very excellent presentation on people who fall down. Um, there are huge friction and policy uh, delays, and, um, and that paper was very important. Um, it was very important for us to think about debt. Uh, during downturn, people do go into debt. This has some effects, and then the, 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 this idea of the hysteresis of the shocks is very important for us to, to take into consideration. So I thought it was an excellent panel for us to begin to understand some of these dynamics. Um, there are real racial components to this because uh, Latino households or black households have no wealth. Debt is a big issue. Um, and the structure of the EITC, as you heard, is very, beneficial during downturns for married couples, but blacks who get EITC are overwhelmingly single parent households. So there are, there are deep racial components that run through this. Um, all that is important. I'm glad that we covered it. Um, but it struck me that a deeper question needs to be asked. And that is, from my perspective, to get the Fed to, um, to respond to a different set of questions, uh, because to my mind, these all beg uh, a different question. So yes, it's important to understand the, how these macroeconomic effects shape inequality, whether they exacerbate them or not. But 
how does the Fed itself actually view inequality as a problem? Now, this comes from my other role, which is being chief economist to the AFL-CIO, which puts me in front of the IMF and the OECD all the time, because labor unions are partners uh, with those organizations. Um, and my frustration has been the IMF thinks inequality hurts growth. The OECD thinks inequality hurts growth. What does the Fed think? This is really important because these conversations we've been having have been like, oh, it's too bad that there's some people left behind. Uh, we scar them. Maybe in the long run they're hurt, but this isn't the purview of the Fed because the Fed really is concerned with economic growth. Yes, there's some distributional things, but these important institutions have decided, no, 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 no. Inequality matters. It hurts growth. So um, I'd love to have the Fed respond to their reports and say to them, well, we looked at your report, we don't think very much of it, or we looked at your report, and aha, you're onto something, we should care about it. Um, so I bring up this report from the IMF on redistribution, inequality, and growth. Um, they look at growth rates, um, and if you look at the duration of growth spells, and the OECD has confirmed this through their own work as well, um, you get shorter growth rates. The, 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 the expansions are shorter. They're significantly shorter when you have higher levels of inequality. There are a number of reasons why that would be so. Um, the creation of new firms is hurt by growing inequality. Uh, when you have a broad shared uh, growth, that means that every household is now a potential new customer because you've changed the budget constraint for every household. And to start a new business in a world in which 185 million new potential customers exist versus to start a new business when there are only 40, potential, 40 million potential new customers, totally different world. The type of businesses that you would think about forming, um, who gets hired, all that would be different. Um, the IMF itself uh, has found that there's this real inverse relationship between the income that goes to the top 20% and economic growth. That the share to the top 20% increases by one percentage point GDP growth is actually lower. This is their conclusion. Um, and in fact, if you put it at the bottom, you get a bigger response. You get better growth. Uh, and there is this other thing, which is, of course, the, the, the politics. The politics leads to, to capture, and there is the fear of real rent seeking once you've concentrated uh, inequality. The OECD has taken another path uh, in looking at it, but they see the same thing. Instead of looking at top 20% or top 1%, they've looked at Gini coefficient and they find something similar, which is that income inequality has a negative and statistically significant impact on medium-term growth. A rising inequality by three Gini points um, is a drag on the economy of 0.35 percentage points. Uh, and for the US, they've actually documented that if you look at the period of increased inequality in the US that took place, uh, from 1985 to 2005, their projection, uh, their estimate is that it hurt the U.S. It actually slowed our growth uh, quite significantly. As you can see, the orange bar is deepest for the U.S. because the U.S. of OECD countries, except Mexico and Turkey, is the most unequal in, in income distribution. Now, it strikes me we, we, we have to up our game. We have to have a response to this. That's a good estimate. That's not a bad estimate. It's an irrelevant. It's not irrelevant, uh, but it's something that, to me, we have to confront. If inequality hurts growth by that amount, then we do have to worry what policies at the Fed exacerbate inequality because that's slowing growth. Now, uh, a problem 
in looking at inequality also is um, the questions that we ask. And we have a different set of stylized facts. The tendency among economists, uh, a lot of people who look at inequality are labor economists, I'm guilty, um, <laughs> tend to look at this because through the lens of labor we get worried that um, people with college education have been doing better than people who don't have college education. And we talk about access to technology at the firm level. We look at inequality from that very micro perspective of the individual. We don't have the same commitment among macroeconomists to look at um, inequality. And, and then you would see something different, I think, because that's what we see in the IMF and the OECD. Uh, it's, it's a different lens and they're, they're asking um, different questions. So I'm going to look at it from that different perspective and ask us to look at some different stylized facts rather than people with college degrees seem to be doing better than people who don't. Um, I actually think that that's the wrong set of questions to ask anyway. Um, Labor share has been declining in the U.S. Uh, I, think, <laughs> I think we look at it wrong because that's the problem. And my hat as the chief economist to the AFL-CIO is that problem, <laughs> is that labor share is getting smaller. And while other people are worried about some people at the top are getting this and some people at the bottom are getting that, if the pie that labor is divvying up is smaller, that's a problem in and of itself. So what are these stylized facts and where do I think the Fed comes in? So there are these correlations, not causations, but there are these correlations that make the stylized facts. I think we need to have a theory that puts them together or could generate these same key stylized facts. One, we know that the gap between wages and productivity has been rising. That's the decline in labor share. Uh, a rising share has gone to finance, and the compensation for finance has gone up relative to everybody else's. In fact, all these gaps look similar. So this is the famous EPI chart. Josh Bivens is here, and this is probably in his DNA now, if not burned into his eyeballs, um, showing for the US, but this is true, the OECD, has been studying the decline in labor share. This is, uh, this, this is true not just in the US. It's more extreme in the US, uh, and it has been true in the US for a longer period than other countries. But basically, since 2000, this is an international trend. Um, but that gap is the declining uh, labor share of income. And it gets to a core issue um, from my perspective, which is, uh, workers have always been told, well, you can't have wages rise unless productivity goes up. And there's a constant mantra about uh, we need investment, you need to do more education and all this so we can get productivity up. Okay, fine. <clears throat> We've been doing that for 40 years. Wages have not gone up. <clears throat> now, no one asks that of profits. Right? Presumably, it should also be true that you can't get more profits if you're not producing more. Uh, we accept that somehow or another profits can go up even if productivity doesn't go up, uh, but that means that you have accepted that we're redistributing from workers. That's what you're accepting. That gap, that blue line, is the gap between wages and productivity it follows indebtedness of the household sector, um, not surprisingly, uh, but it should be another one of those stylized facts, right? If people aren't making enough money to buy the output, if they're not making it, then how are they buying the output? A way to do that is they borrow, and debt has gone up by that amount. Debt on the household side, and the ledger has to show up, so this is the liability for the household side, has to show up as an asset for somebody else. Somebody else is gaining from that declining labor share. Uh, finance has been gaining a big share of GDP. Um, this is from 
a truck from Brad DeLong, Brad DeLong, but other people looked at this issue as well. This is kind of a confusing chart. No offense to, the, to those of you in finance, but finance is transportation of money. You take money from surplus savers to people who need to invest it. Hopefully you do it efficiently. Um, when we look at our railroads, they have increased their efficiency tremendously. They can move tons of freight now for much lower cost. You would think with computers and everything else that finance actually wouldn't be a bigger share of GDP. It would be perhaps a flat share of GDP just because productivity in the sector should have made it much easier to efficiently move excess savings to uh, where investment needs to take place. This chart is confusing unless you think about it as something else is going on. And then that productivity gap looks just like the gap between uh, compensation and the financial services versus the non-financial services. The two look the same. So my thing is, let's ask a different set of stylized facts for theory to explain. How do all these things persist? And there is a role for the Fed, it strikes me, in all of this. Um, the Fed oversees the financial sector. The Fed gets to say to banks, as Neil has pointed out, so this also coincides with something that you've cared about, which is this is the concentration of banking. We're also, I could do that chart as well, <laughs> um, where in 1990, we had this many banks, now we have this many banks, but if you look at the top, it shrunk much faster. Uh, so there's a risk factor here that is also embedded, from my perspective, in this inequality factor. And from my perspective, uh, and, the late, and what we've been going through and bargaining uh, with almost every union, is increasingly uh, labor unions find there's nothing to bargain over. Because when you come to the table, the pie's already been divided. Somebody already took it from the top. Increasingly, companies that we deal with are heavily leveraged. So the manager isn't going to get to tell you what you're going to get paid because he's already paying off somebody else's debt. Uh, workers also find out that this is why you're going to lose your pension, because we're going to declare bankruptcy, because we have all of this debt uh, on the part of many companies. Um, this this behavior, this predatory behavior, this aggressive behavior is only possible in part by this increased concentration, uh, which is why it's even more important that the Fed look at, are these banks not only a threat to the financial system, but are they a threat because they are a source of this increased inequality? There's no reason for that share of finance to be going should be actually flat. That money doesn't need to be going to finance. It should be going to um, productivity increases, real investments, and a way for wages to go up. Now, the other problem is, um, you know, the, 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 the Fed has argued that we should all be happy because of price stability. That's the post-1980 era. And we can see from the green line, we have this wonderful price stability. Um, very little variation in price. The previous period was supposed to be bad because look at all that price instability. One of the papers we saw, though, asked the question about debt. And what's the role of inflation? Uh, because the holder of debt, in the case of a downturn, uh, is now stuck with the bad end of the deal. Unexpected inflation is a way of hitting <laughs> the lenders in the financial sector uh, and evening out the cost of bad decisions. Uh, so I think we have to take into consideration that that previous period, as bad as some people may think it was, may have had some good because the unexpected inflation the eats away at, um, at the debt and gives a bigger space for people who are indebted to get out of debt. And as you saw, household debt has just exploded in this period where we have price stability. 
On the labor side, uh, that price stability has come at a real cost. So in the pre-period, which was supposed to be the bad period, uh, mean unemployment for the U.S. was 5.2%. The mean is now 6%. Um, and the months that Americans have been below 6%, it's only like 59% of the time. So, you know, roughly, very roughly, it's like two-thirds. But we spent a whole one-third of our time at an unemployment rate that's not full employment. 6% isn't full employment, but 6% is closer to a recession. But we spent a whole third, a little more than a third of the period, with very high unemployment. This is going to have real cost. As we heard, there's, did you enter during the time of the highest of this unemployment rate? And if it's way high, then of course it's going to take you even longer. The penalty is going to have a long residual to it. Um, if you're among the groups, African Americans have twice this unemployment rate, uh, then this means for African Americans, right, the mean is 12, roughly speaking. Uh, that's an unemployment rate which is disastrous to any labor market functioning if you're going to have persistent um, high unemployment. Now, here's the other challenge, uh, and that is... Uh, as much as economists want to believe that you get consensus, um, I heard someone think that, oh, it wouldn't be hard to get a group of people who would want inflation if they're heavily in debt, like the household sector is. No, it actually is very hard <laughs> to get coalitions to, to address these. Um, and it isn't the case that those who are long-suffering necessarily blame themselves. Uh, if they did, uh, and you know we've seen that from increased um, suicides and, and other deaths that are caused by the economic downturn, that would be one thing. Unfortunately, uh, people who find themselves in bad spots uh, can be demagogued into thinking it's somebody else's fault. Uh, that's a real threat. It is a global real threat. The decline in labor share, again, is a global phenomena, and we are facing a global threat of maintaining democracy. It's a real threat, whether we're talking about Brazil, Austria, Poland, uh, one could go on. The United States isn't exempt from that. So here's the problem. America's economic majority, meaning those who control most of the income, looks like this. This is its demographic majority. It looks like that. They aren't the same. The current trends of people questioning the economic system is a dangerous, very dangerous scenario in which you have demagogues who are willing to exploit the difference between the economic majority and the political majority. This is real, and I think it's not to anyone's benefit that we do things that exacerbate it. So not only do I think it's important from the economic sense that we understand inequality hurts growth, and what are the mechanisms through which we know that inequality hurts growth, and therefore, what can we do to address inequality? But this has the importance of maintaining the institutions on which we think everything operates, and the consensus on which we think things operate. We, we should understand we are in a dangerous position to believe that those institutions can continue. The fight that we are facing in state after state over voter suppression is not a new fight that Americans have had to confront. We have had states in the past who have made it their duty to suppress votes, to limit who will participate in democracy because the economic majority and the demographic majority aren't the same people. That's a dangerous place to live. So um, I'm hoping we can confront the bigger question to me that, that's lying out here. Yes. Macroeconomic 
economic effects have different outcomes. Sometimes they create persistent gaps that we find very hard to address. The black-white unemployment rate we can affect by ensuring that we pursue maximum employment, and this recovery has achieved that. When you look at black-white labor force participation, they're now, well, three months ago, they were now virtually equal. Um, unfortunately, uh, because the economy has slowed, the rate at which new job openings occurred, we saw last month in jolts, has slowed, and we know the black unemployment rate goes up in those instances where new job creation isn't fast enough. So, yes, maximum employment can address some of this and can alleviate some of the inequality, but we have a bigger question to ask ourselves, and I hope that we ask ourselves that bigger question. And if we change the stylized facts that we're trying to explain, then that may help us at trying to get at what is it we need to address and what are the tools that the Fed has to address them. If it's not just a matter of correlation between the financial sector getting bigger and the weight that that has on firms bargaining with their workers over what will be the wage increase, and again, my observation has been, when we have polled our affiliate unions in the AFL-CAO, it is across the board. The table's already been set. We already had dinner. You guys, you're here to bargain. It's bargaining about who's picking up the tip, because <laughs> we already ate. Um, the money has already been divided up. Workers truly don't have access to that increased productivity. The concentration of banking power, power um, is something the Fed has authority over. Compensation in the financial sector is something that the Fed can clearly signal. Y'all can't be expecting your engineers on the train. Uh, I liken this to the very negative way in which people sometimes depict labor unions. Um, the old story of the Teamsters being, uh, you expect me to deliver all these cigarettes in this truck and you don't think I'm taking some of the cigarettes? Uh, the Fed needs to say to the bankers, you're just moving the money. You're the truck driver. You don't get to go in the back of the truck. <laughs> That's not your role. And these compensation packages that you're demanding, you're going to the back of the truck. You're supposed to move money that's not productive to money that is productive. That doesn't mean you take a cut. It's very tempting, right? You're asking me to move hundreds of billions of dollars to make somebody else a profit. But you know what? You're the truck driver. That's your job. So hopefully, um, we'll learn from this conference that there are macro effects that exacerbate inequality. There are some programs we know that can address that. Some of them we're good at. But I hope we can dedicate ourselves to, but does it matter? And ask ourselves, does inequality hurt growth? And answer ourselves, if it does, then what is the Fed supposed to do about it? Thank you. So obviously the uh, Fed has a dual mandate of both uh, paying attention to the inflation rate and the rate of growth of, of employment. And I think that Bill in his preceding comments was suggesting perhaps it adopt a third target, which has to do with um, inequality. But in any event, um, uh, it, it certainly has these, these dual mandates. And as those of you who were um, at yesterday's session may remember, uh, President Kashkari suggested, and I hope I don't um, misparaphrase you, but uh, that the most important effect of Fed policy is on labor markets. It's on jobs, it's on human capital uh, formation. 
and certainly Hannes's presentation from the previous um, session really underscored the very adverse, persistent effects that recessions can have on not only uh, um, employment and wages, but also on health effects. Um, we also, for, for um, those who were here yesterday, had a series of discussions on what was exactly the trade-off um, uh, between inflation and employment, discussions about the uh, Phillips curve and the apparent weakening of the relationship between unemployment and inflation. And so the, the somewhat uh, you know, paradox that's, that's um, certainly been apparent at least for the last decade or so is, is that if we think about the standard measures that the Fed uses to judge the strength of the um, uh, labor market, first and foremost, their unemployment, the unemployment rate, which is measured in the CPS and has been for a while under 4%. We also look at employment growth measured in the current employment statistics program, which is really capturing wage and salary employment. And those have both been quite robust, you know, um, signaling very strong labor markets for a while. But on the other hand, while improving, labor force participation rates um, have remained uh, somewhat low, particularly among less educated men and women. And at least until wa uh, recently, wage growth has been sluggish, even as the unemployment rate has come uh, uh, down quite a bit. So the data suggests, in, uh, as Janet Yellen has said, as well as many others, that there, that there are structural problems that are not being captured uh, in standard labor market measures. So today, as Alessandra uh, foreshadowed, I'm going to talk about one hypothesis of a structural problem, as it were. I don't know if we want to label it a problem, but just a characteristic of the labor market, which is that the whole nature of the employment relationship is changing. There have been widespread uh, media reports backed by some research evidence of a trend growth in alternative work arrangements. And the media reports in particular have really landed or focused attention on independent contractor and other what I'll call non-employee work, um, sometimes referred quite broadly as gig work. Um, why do we care about if there has been a growth in these sorts of arrangements, why do we care about them? Well, at the very least, we care because these workers are not employees. Therefore, they are not covered by social insurance programs. They are, by definition, outside of the unemployment insurance system, outside of the workers' compensation system. Um, they're not also, by virtue of the fact that they're not employees, they're not covered by employment and labor laws. Okay, so they're not covered by minimum wages, uh, wage and, various wage and hours laws. Um, they're not covered by laws that protect collective bargaining or union formation. And also they're ineligible for employee benefits, which is an important part of compensation for most workers in regular employment arrangements or standard employee employee arrangements. Arguably also, these are associated with fragmentation of work and therefore reduced working uh, bargaining power. I also wanted to mention that not only has there been some evidence of an increased trend in these sorts of arrangements, but uh, as a recent paper by Larry Katz and the late Alan Kruger uh, showed, they're also cyclical, so counter-cyclical measures. Not surprisingly, these sorts of arrangements would increase during recessions. So concerns about the growth of gig and other non-standard work spurred the funding of the contingent work supplement by the BLS uh, uh, in 2017. This is a supplement to the CPS. It was the first time it had been funded in 12 years. What was the result? With everyone was anticipating a great increase. The CWS, in contrast, found absolutely no evidence of an increase in any alternative work arrangements. In fact, it found a decline in those working as, in, in, as a share, those working as independent contractors, independent consultants, and freelancers. These are sort of the non-employee categories, the unincorporated self-employed. Um, they added some new questions on work obtained through online platforms and mobile apps. These, unfortunately, didn't work as intended. So we really 
don't have at least official, good official measures of, of the uh, growth in this sort of thing. So how do people react to the CWS report? Um, here's a headline from Ben Castleman in the New York Times. Maybe the gig economy isn't reshaping work after all. And I particularly like this quote from uh, Larry Michelle, then president of EPI, who said, this, the contingent work supplement throws cold water on those hyping the explosion of freelancing and the rapidly changing nature of work. And the lesson that Larry and others would draw from this is that we should focus on problems with regular jobs. Um, but in the same article, uh, Castleman uh, you know, suggested that others were skeptical about the numbers coming out of the contingent work supplement. Um, paraphrasing an old Bob Solo quote about productivity, he said, you can see the gig economy everywhere, but in the statistics. And indeed, as I you know, have, have mentioned earlier in my talk, there's a lot of conflicting evidence. Um, research in particular using administrative tax data, a series of studies, have shown higher levels and substantial growth in uh, self-employment, particularly what we might think of as this uh, kind of independent contractor um, uh, uh, type of arrangement. Um, that is not those in particular running businesses, but uh, independent contractor kinds of arrangements. So what potentially could be wrong, going wrong with our main household surveys, like the CPS or the American Community Survey and the like, which also doesn't show any growth in uh, self-employment. So independent contractors, people have speculated that independent contractor work may not be recorded or be, be miscoded. Individuals may not think, may not report certain types of informal work. They may not think of them as a traditional job. I'm just dog walking, right? It's not a traditional job. And so it may not be counted in these um, you know, primary household surveys. Individuals also may mi be miscoded in the surveys as employees when they're being treated, um, uh, when in fact in the workplace they're being treated as independent contractors or other non-employees. Household surveys also may miss a lot of secondary jobs or work activities um, in the form of you know, independent contractor or non-employee work. Just by virtue, and I'll go into this shortly, just by virtue of the way that the household surveys are constructed. Um, also, it's important to note that the contingent work supplement asks only about the main job, but often, and there's other evidence to this effect, that independent contractor work supplements that in the main job. Okay. So in this talk, in the re remaining uh, 20 minutes or so, what I'd like to do is to focus on two research pieces that I've been involved in um, that provide some evidence of shortcomings of household surveys. One actually uses a Federal Reserve Board um, uh, uh, survey, uh, the, uh, uh, a module included in the Survey of Household Economic Decision Making. This work was joint with Catherine Abraham. And I want to just flag here that the SHED survey um, module as also, there, there are a couple of other surveys, one conducted by the uh, module by the Boston Fed in a New York uh, Fed survey, as well as a preceding survey. And they all point to kind of high levels of work activity, second job holding, that appear not to be being captured in uh, basic um, uh, surveys. Um, and the second one are findings uh, from a nightly Gallup survey um, that broadly asks about contract work. This is also joint with Catherine Abraham and my colleague at the Upjohn Institute, Brad Hirschpine. So briefly, the SHED data that we're looking at pull data from this module in two years, 2016 and 2017. Um, the structure of the employment questions is as follows. All individuals are, are kind of first asked about employment activities in the last month. If they had any employment, they're asked about their main job. Then they're asked whether they did any uh, of, you know, uh, roughly a dozen types of informal work or side jobs for pay that were not part of their main job. So this particular survey is really good at getting at that, those extra things that people might be doing to kind of make ends meet. Um, in terms of the informal work or side jobs that they ask about, they have three categories. 
personal services like child care, elder care, dog walking, house cleaning, yard work, online activities like online tasks, renting, selling, driving for ride sharing apps and the like. This is what sometimes people call gig work in, in a narrow sense, this development. And then offline sales, miscellaneous, selling at thrift shops, et cetera. So, and then they also collect this information on why individuals are doing these informal um, work activities or side jobs and its importance to their income. Sort of um, main reason, are they doing it to earn income? There's suggest subjective assessment of the importance to household income in the last year, the percent of income that they usually derive from these uh, uh, side jobs, and the hours that they usually spend. And so this is kind of informs us of how important are these kinds of activities, particularly that may be being, may, being missed in, in main surveys. Um, so what is really striking is, in the SHED survey, is the incredibly high prevalence of, the, uh, of, of this work, at least according to the survey. You have 28 percent, is a weighted percent, of individuals answering the survey that at some point in time in the last month they participated in one of these kinds of activities for pay. Um, and uh, nearly 12% uh, reported doing uh, two or more of these activities. And they were um, roughly evenly divided. They were important in all three of the categories, per personal services, online activities, and other. Um, in terms of the importance of work, 18% uh, of those surveyed said they did these, these kinds of activities in order to earn money. And a smaller but significant share um, indicated that they did it, um, it was important in a subjective sense to their income in the last year, uh, uh, nearly 10 percent that it uh, indicated that it, it accounted for at least 10 percent of their income typically, um, and a uh, somewhat smaller share that it, they usually counted um, for 20 or, or worked 20 or more hours a month on this. Okay, so let's think about who does this, these side jobs in informal work and why. So perhaps not surprisingly, um, it seems to be concentrated in particularly vulnerable groups and groups that are engaged in other sorts whose main job is what one might say is a, a non-standard or, or precarious employment arrangement. So youth, minorities, low educated, low income, um, uh, for example, and those in non-standard work arrangements and the, and the unemployed um, uh, uh, report significantly more likely to do this kind of work to earn money, view the informal work as important to their income last year, that they usually rely on informal work for 10% or more of their household income, and that they usually work at least 20 hours a month on these side jobs. So here I'll just show you quickly a series of graphs just to kind of illustrate this. Interestingly, this is the one, this is uh, showing informal work or side jobs by education level. And interestingly, this is the one case where informal work, the incidence slightly increases by level of education. So the dark bar is high school or less. The mi middle bar is some college and college plus is on the far right, the light. So you really don't see much in, in difference there. But then when you look at how people report out whether it's important to their income, then you see the expected pattern. Those with a high school or less, 12% of those respondents indicated this kind of work was important to their income in a subjective sense. And uh, a little under 12% indicated those in a high school or less indicated it was um, uh, accounted typically for 10% or more of their income. So an important sor source. Um, if we look at uh, side jobs or informal work by income, we not surprisingly perhaps see, but we strongly see that it is associated with level of income. The bar on the left is those who uh, are earning less than 50,000 a year. Uh, then the middle is 50 to 100 and then 100 plus. And again, we see the patterns that we expect. Um, those who are poor 
are reporting that this kind of income is, is very important to their um, uh, you know, overall income as a very important overall to their income and that they rely on it um, uh, for 10% or more of their household income. Okay. People are also asked about the degree of financial stress. This is a subjective notion, but uh, they can report they are finding it difficult to get by, just getting by, doing okay, usually living comfortably. Here we find very strong patterns in the expected direction. Those who are under some level of financial stress are much more likely to engage in these activities, to do it to earn money, and to rely on it for household income. I think that this um, final set of charts from this survey that I'll, I'll show is kind of interesting because here um, we're, I, I'm sort of sep we're separating it out by type of work arrangement. Are they full time? It may be difficult for you to see this in the back, but. Uh, the, the bars are, are they full-time, uh, are they voluntary part-time, are they involuntary part-time, self-employed, uh, they also have a contract consultant category, unemployed, it's kind of interesting that people who are unemployed also report working, but they do <laughs> in these side jobs, and not in the labor force. And you'll see that informal work to earn, um, uh, to earn money is um, uh, particularly important amongst, uh, or uh, important to their income, or usually accounts for 10% or more of their household income, is particularly important in these categories where people are involuntarily part-time, they are self-employed or contract workers, um, or unemployed. So clearly, disproportionately, it appears to be a mechanism for people who are on some degree of financial stress or are in non standard jobs as a way of making ends meet. So let me move in um, the remaining few minutes to just talk briefly about the Gallup survey module that we are conducting. The module adds 14 questions on contract work, primarily independent contractor, non-employee work, but also uh, contract company work to a nightly, uh, to the Gallup Education Pulse survey, that's a nightly phone survey, we are surveying respondents age 18 to 80. We did this across four waves, across, spread across a year, so that we can measure uh, seasonal seasonality to this, which actually hasn't been captured in prior surveys. Um, each data collection lasts about a month and yields about 15,000 respondents, completed responses. Um, one thing that I'm going to emphasize today is, is that we're actually testing question wording um, for uh, selected uh, questions. Respondents are randomly assigned to different questions. The goal, a large part of the goal of this, this project, is to better understand um, how uh, household surveys might be improved uh, to better capture these kinds of work arrangements that we think they're not capturing very well, particularly. Oh, in that survey? Yeah. Both. Both. Yeah. And we have a geographic location, and it's, yeah. So we, the, the, the final survey module was just completed last week, and we now have over 60,000 um, responses. And I'll just uh, cover a little bit about what we're finding here. So the goals of the Gallup module are specifically to uncover miscoding of employment status as employee work. That is, this household surveys are just not capturing people who are independent contractors and the like. Also to capture all forms of work for pay, including informal work that may not be being reported very well in government surveys. And I'll, that's what I'll focus on here, but I'll just, as a quick advertisement, uh, say that the module is also designed to probe older workers and how they might be using uh, independent contractor work, non-employee work, to transition into retirement, measure, as I said, contract company work, and uh, measure work secured through online platforms and mobile apps. Okay, so let me um, uh, go to the first um, uh, goal, which was to test whether individuals 
um, are miscoded as employees in the survey. So here's the basic Gallup question um, to use to identify employees. Thinking about your work situation over the past seven days, have you been employed by an employer, even minimally, like for an hour or more, from whom you receive money or goods? So think about this. Think about the situation where perhaps you're an independent contractor. My institute occasionally hires people on a contract basis. They're not treated as our employees. If somebody were asked this, they might very well answer correctly in a, in a common use sense of the word that, yes, I'm employed by this Upjohn Institute because they're working for us. Right? So you can see how it happens. Um, so what we do is we follow up with mo the, this module question to probe whether the worker is an employee or a non-employee. We ask specifically, were you an employee on this job, or were you an independent contractor, independent consultant, or freelance worker? These are modeled on the language that's used in the contingent work supplement. So we're using language that's already embedded in, into government surveys, designed to, to get at this. Um, and then a second version, since with a lot of cognitive testing and, and uh, so forth, it seemed that people were kind of confused about who, what an independent contractor was, uh, we, we simply asked, did this employer take any taxes out of your pay? Because if you're being treated as an employee, at a minimum, you should be having some Social Security taxes taken out. So actually, the incidence was quite high in our, among our Gallup respondents who said, in fact, were in flagging that they weren't employees, even though they had said they worked for an employer, employed by an employer. 10.8% uh, responded yes, that they were independent contractor, independent consultant, or freelancer, and not an employee. And um, somewhat lower, but still quite high, 8.9% stated that their employer does not take taxes out of their pay. And the correlates among these two measures are actually quite high. So we found some comfort to that. Um, you might stop at this point and say, well, what does this have to do with the CPS? You know, how was that worded, and is this really relevant to the questions that are on standard government household surveys? So let's go through the language, and we'll argue that while it is not the same, there's similar sorts of language problems. The basic wording of the CPS is, last week, did you do any work for either pay or profit? Okay, and then to distinguish whether these people are doing working as employees or self-employed, respondents are asked, were you employed by a government, by a private company, a nonprofit organization, or were you self-employed or working in a family business? Now, it's quite possible that if you, they do have the word self-employed in here, and it's quite possible that you say you're an independent contractor for the Upjohn Institute, that you would think about the fact that they were asking a legal question here, were you an employee? And you might say, I am self-employed. So some people might res respond correctly, yes. But you might also just say, yeah, I'm working for a, a nonprofit organization. And it's quite possible that, that th this kind of uh, uh, thing is, is really embedded, or potential problem is really embedded in the uh, question wording in the household surveys. Um, also, somebody in many positions particularly if they are not running a business themselves, they're unincorporated, self-employed, um, may not think of themselves as self-employed, you know, especially the less formal the work arrangement is. So, uh, and also, I'll just briefly add that the CWS provides some evidence of employee miscoding in the, in the CPS. It turns out that about 15% of those identified as independent contractors who by definition should be self-employed, actually reported in the main CPS that they were employees. So, or, sorry, actually this is an important point. Nobody, at no point in any of these household surveys has anybody asked if they're an employee. They reported you know, being employed by one of these organizations and then they were coded as being an, an employee. So. I think there is, it may not be the same level that we're finding in the Gallup, but I think there is strong evidence just based on the wording that there is likely to be a significant coding problem in the CPS, also based on this other 
uh, tax administrative data that shows large discrepancies between the two. So finally, I'll just uh, conclude with a brief mention. Um, one of the goals is to capture, of the Gallup survey is to capture um, all types, all sources of work activity. And we actually find, consistent with the SHED actually survey module, quite high uh, reporting of multiple work activities. Um, and the incidence is especially high amongst those who are in some kind of independent contractor, non-employee work arrangement in their main job, which suggests that these people in these kinds of work arrangements are sort of patching together a lot of different things to make ends meet. Um, I'm not, I don't have the time and, and I don't need to go into the weeds with, with this audience on it, but sort of why wouldn't it be captured in um, potentially, and this is our hypothesis potentially in a, in a survey like the CPS or ACS or whatever, and we think that it, a lot of it has to do with question wording. So the more that you probe about these sorts of things, the more likely when you test questions you're likely to uncover um, uh, secondary work activities. Um, the Gallup has work language, for example, did you work even minimally, like for an hour or more? Um, it asks people both whether, or at least on our version, we ask people both whether they were employed by employer and did they have any self-employment activities. And when we asked about self-employment, we just didn't throw out the word self-employment, okay? There was an expansive, or I should say we, Gallup, does this regularly, there was an expansive definition about what could constitute self-employment. Um, and then there was additional probing, did you forget anything? And, and of course people do. Um, any, any other sorts of um, uh, kind of informal work that you might not think of as a job. Um, did you forget to report? And so collectively when you add some of that up, that uh, it, it comes up with a very high level of, of this work act, secondary work activity. Um, so just to conclude, the Gallup findings are consistent with those of earlier studies pointing to a significant understatement of self-employment and independent contractor work in a household service, and it's certainly something that should be investigated more. Um, both the Gallup and the Shed suggest considerably, as I just mentioned, higher levels of multiple job holding or uh, people engaging in, in lots of informal work activities. I want to, at this point, just sort of exercise some caution here because both the Shed surveys and the Gallup surveys are different surveys. There could easily be, I don't want to land too, too much or emphasize too much the levels of multiple job holding that are found in these surveys because there could be you know, significant differences in the representativeness of the populations here. But we think there's also enough with formal question wording testing to suggest that the truth is somewhere in between. That you know, the, the, the standard household surveys are likely to be missing some of this um, additional work activity. Um, there's a strong association between secondary jobs, often informal work and precarious non-standard self-employment arrangements on the main job, and this informal work, contract work, may actually be a manifestation of problems with those jobs themselves. It needs to be explored more. And informal work is strongly associated with people whose main jobs typically do not have benefits. And my final um, comment is, is just that I think the development of consistent high quality uh, time series on contract work and informal work would help the Fed and other policymakers to kind of better understand the degree of slack in the labor market. We want to measure to what degree are there actually trends in this because from a policy perspective these people are outside of uh, the basic social safety net that we've created. Um, to cover in, uh, workers in, in traditional employee arrangements. And also, we think, and some evidence su suggests, that this stuff is countercyclical. So it can be like another measure, um, uh, another indicator of labor market tightness or slackness. Thank you. I'll have the privilege of asking a 
question to both our speakers and then open up uh, to questions from the audience. So something that I've been uh, uh, hearing, you know, in this couple of days is, you know, there are some uh, categories out there that are clearly more fragile and uh, more sensitive to the uh, impact of recessions of the cycles. These are the youth, these are the minorities. These are the low educated workers, these are the low income people, these are the unemployed. So we saw that these categories, these demographics, these categories of people have been hit hard. They have a hard time finding a job when they lose it. They have, uh, uh, you know, they show persistence in their um, uh, outcomes even over time. So these losses take a long time to. Um, recover and sometimes they never recover and it shows up in health outcomes in labor outcomes and so on we also you know heard from Bill that probably these are the people also that lost the bargaining power that are not represented anymore that don't see their wages grow anymore and um, and we heard that, that these are probably also the same people that are resorting to informal labor arrangements so these are also probably the people that are uh, outside the safety net and um, uh, have less um, um, coverage from uh, society. So there is a broad question here that is sort of linking all this uh, presentation that is what to do about it. And um, I think you can have sort of two ways in which you can picture uh, the problem. One it could be that you want to just uh, target these populations directly and, uh, you know, with some sort of safety measures and trying to, and I think that's what Bill was talking about. Um, but the other one is also um, making this fragile population less fragile. So, you know, trying to make sure that mobility and opportunities are open to all. And in this sense, you know, the kind of policies in order that would eventually help these categories to become stronger and get an education and enter the labor market and training and so on, maybe different from the policies that you would use to simply get them uh, uh, off the ground. So one is an investment and is a, sort of like a mobility kind of uh, um, policy, you know, trying to improve mobility and to improve opportunities for all. And the other one is, okay, I have some people that I need to help right now directly um, where they are. And I was wondering about, you know, what do you think should be the policies that would be more helpful for which categories, especially in light of a globalized world where, you know, uh, the firms here may eventually bring um, jobs overseas and where, uh, you know, like we have to think about um, not just the, the health, you know, of our jobs here, but also how they, um, the competitiveness compared to other, you know, countries, uh, in particular, all the China and uh, all the other uh, countries where now uh, our firms are moving to. So, what are your perspectives about what to do for these categories of people in terms of policies, and what are the you know the implications? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> uh, a, a very deep, probing question. So first, in the case of, of racial minorities, and in the case of gender, th these are overlays with a way in which the economy functions that most economists uh, ignore. So. Um, it, first off, it's not true. The problem in the black community is not skills, investment, and all that. That does not explain the gaps. It's, 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 and, and it's not helpful mm -hmm. as a construct. Because uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in, in times when the economy is and the labor market is tight, um, blacks with much more education finally get unemployment rates of whites who are much less educated. Yes. So it's important to understand that if, if you just want to have a rule of thumb, uh, the unemployment rate for white high school dropouts. So these are people for whom we have no meaningful investment. Right. That is the black unemployment rate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this idea, well, we're going to, you know, improve black educational attainment. And, uh, 
that's not going to change the gap. This is not going to change the two to one unemployment rate. The way to affect that two to one unemployment rate is to have a tight labor market because that's the only thing that really moves the black unemployment rate. Uh, this relative position is, is deeper, and one cannot blame the Fed for the, the, the way in which uh, our society is organized. One can hold the Fed accountable for making sure that it does pursue maximum employment mm -hmm. so that at least, given how the economy works, the Fed is not making it worse. <laughs> it's, not, it's not contributing to it, and it, can, and it can change some of these relative positions. Um, so that's, that's first. Uh, and too often, uh, because this is uh, a lot of inequality work is done by labor economists, they want to focus on human capital. It's not helpful when you talk about racial gender capital. disparities or racial disparities. That, that, that needs a different model than what most economists can imagine. So, so having said that, again, to me, it's... Uh, understanding those implications, you know, what does the Fed need to think about for macro policy because that does influence those levels. Second is to back up, as I'm hoping people will do, and say, okay, d why do I care that there are these inequalities out there? And, and I do think the Fed needs to actively engage the IMF is not a bunch of wild people. <laughs> the OECD, they're not a bunch of wild people. These are people who are concerned about macroeconomic policy outcomes. They put forth credible research that says any quality hurts growth, and for a number of reasons. One, they point to the, the, the level of inequality hurts human capital investment. Mm -hmm and you won't get sufficient levels of human capital. That's one of the big contributors they have identified. But for the Fed to then ignore the IMF and the OECD and treat them like they're, you know, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, you know, heterodox economist, um, is, 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 I, I think is missing. I think the Fed has to look at the work and say, that's credible, we, we've looked at it, it makes sense, and so we have to worry about the shape of inequality, and, and, and so we need a response. I've suggested that a possible source of that inequality, particularly when you look post-1980, has to do with financial concentration, a much undue rising share of GDP going to financial mm -hmm. activities, and that takes out essentially the it, it's it's equivalent to that gap we've seen in the shrinking labor share, and I think many economists are looking at the wrong thing. If the, the the recent work done on the minimum wage looks at you know the wage distribution, then says if you do a shock, if you raise the minimum wage, then what happens to the wage distribution? Mm -hmm. See, I think economists have to do the same thing. If somebody puts sh uh, uh, pressure on the wage distribution because we're going to take money out of the wage pile, right? Then you should ask the question. It's like a fluid dynamic issue, right? If you're, a, if you're an engineer, if you put pressure down on a fluid, how will, will it respond? Mm -hmm. And you're going to get that it's going to disperse in different ways. And if you understand some institutions, you may well expect that if, if I put it at the, at the point of uh, initial contact, that's the height, that's the middle income, I'm going to squish the middle, <laughs> and it's going to squirt out. This is this would be the fluid dynamic answer. So you know, economists are looking for all other answers, and and to me, often getting silly answers. Uh, EPI has documented this, um, except for the top 40 percent of college graduates, um, everybody else's income has been falling. And labor economists, you know, get into this relative thing. I don't really care that my income is rising relative to somebody else. This is not a victory. <laughs> this is a cause of concern because if, if, if this inequality is being caused by somebody squishing down on the fluid and my piece of pie is getting smaller, that's what I care about. And so you telling me that, oh, well, you know, we didn't squish you? Like, I'm next. So this is not, this is not a solution for me. I'm not feel, I do not feel comforted uh, 
that somehow or another relative to a high school dropout, I'm better off. So, uh, so I, 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 think, um, I think we've been asking the wrong questions. And I think if we start asking, does that inequality hurt growth? Does it give us bad outcomes like debt-led growth instead of income-led growth? Then I think we'll start asking questions about what do we worry about and how do we worry about it? I think we'll ask them differently. Okay. Great. Thank you. Let me, let me um, before I, I talk about the, the questions that pertain specifically to my talk, let me reply uh, to something that, that Bill just said. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what policies do we recommend for um, minorities and so forth? They, who Unemployment even during expansionary periods are persistently high and so forth. And I just want to, um, you know, you mentioned human capital and that has may have its limitations. What, another strategy is working with employers, okay? There's a really interesting um, case uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, not too far from where I work, um, of one of the very large hospitals that was plagued by high turnover. And it got in some consultants in there to reduce, basically to reduce turnover. The focus was very much on the bottom line, but what they did was they put in evidence-based hiring. And they really had to take a lot of discretion away from managers. And they went in and they had these high-priced consultants and they worked with them for over a year. And sure enough, they reduced dramatically turnover, they re increased productivity, everything was good. And a byproduct was uh, um, hiring of minorities went up by 20%. Mm -hmm. It's a large mm -hmm. uh, hospital system. A lot of people were quite excited about this and currently the Kellogg Foundation has a, um, is sponsoring uh, experiments with other employers across a diverse group of, uh, you know, if coming from different industries, different sizes and so forth to see if they can't replicate this. But the broader point is, is that, you know, some of it has to do with hiring behavior, undoubtedly, when we, we're talking about minorities and to some degree women as well, of employers and can you, um, you know, uh, address that, that, uh, you know, practices that, that possibly are hurting bottom line. Um, with regard to alternative work arrangements, I do believe that we need a better um, handle on how extensive they are mm -hmm. to know how to address them. I mean, there's clearly concerns because, um, uh, you know, I focused on the uh, non-employees, independent contractors who are just outside of the social safety net. Um, we need to get a better understanding of, of, of the magnitude and scope. But there certainly has been interest um, by some academics. Um, I think of Seth Harris and, and Alan Kruger put out some proposals to address this problem. Um, it's been embraced by Senator Mark Warner of Virginia and uh, being pushed to some degree by the Aspen Institute to kind of rethink the social contract. Mm -hmm. And if indeed work is going to be expanding along these dimensions, how do we reform policy to uh, accommodate this? I think a big open question, just to conclude, um, this set of remarks is, is that we don't have a very good handle also, not just on the magnitude, but also the trajectories mm -hmm. that people follow when they are in these types of arrangements. Some research coming out of the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute suggests that people who are in these online mobile app platforms do it very temporarily, right? So they're doing it to fill in gaps in employment when they're unemployed. And that's a really interesting... And if that's really true, then we might not be so concerned because they're just temporary gap filling measures. It offers flexibility. You know, it, uh, well, yeah. yeah, but it's also they're, they're kind of using it for times when uh, to, right. to fill in. Yes, it offers flexibility. Um, but you might think that the J.P. Morgan Chase folks, people who bank at J.P. Morgan Chase, may not be representative sure. of the population overall and the, and, the, and the population that we're most concerned about. So that's something that we need to better understand. Sure. Uh, thank you both for the interesting presentations. I guess I have a question for each of you very quickly because I know we don't have a ton of time left. Bill, uh, when you were here a couple years ago, you presented your monetary policy framework and you said we need to get to the fourth quadrant. And we've talked about that actually a lot uh, since then, uh, my colleagues and I. 
And you showed in your chart up here how often we're at high unemployment states of the economy. I'm just curious, when you think about the Fed operating monetary policy, just limiting the monetary policy, what could the Fed do differently to achieve better average employment outcomes? And then I have a question for Susan. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm encouraged by the language from the Fed. So, so language on maximum employment is better than some idea that there is uh, uh, an, an unemployment target. Um, so that, I think, is key, because that gets the Fed to look at the employment to population ratio. And I think we all understand it's not where we think it should be. And I think that's a huge important step. Um, I, I, I do think um, by paying attention to the black unemployment rate, it's helpful. You can predict the response in the paper that I did. We, we found you could use the black unemployment rate or the white unemployment rate because these structural factors, and we do have, I mean, we know we have ways to address it. And, that's the reason why blacks tend to be in larger corporations than mm -hmm. small firms is this fact that they have solved the agency problem of hiring. Mm -hmm. but, 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 um, but that means these last couple of months where you saw the black labor market falter, that I think the Fed should take as a real warning. And, um, and I think it may be because the Fed actually did overplay its hand, auto sales spiked last quarter, I mean, in, in, in the fall, and they've been coming down, auto loan delinquencies are going up. All of this, uh, I take as very bad signs because it means from my perspective, we're moving backwards in terms of the quadrants. We're moving way away from maximum employment. Thank you, and then Susan, very quickly, I think you touched on this in, in your last comment. Uh, when I think about the gig economy, I'm just trying to think about how people would answer these surveys. So anecdotally, so Minneapolis had the Final Four. Last year we had the Super Bowl. Allegedly, people put their apartments on Airbnb to make a little money. Many of these people, I assume, are gainfully employed in traditional jobs, and yet they saw an opportunity for a weekend. Or I think I've thought about myself. When I went to sell my old car, I sold it on eBay. You know, I'm gainfully employed. But I'm not sure how would those um, people selling a one-off item on eBay or listing their apartment every once in a while or Airbnb, how would you think about them and how would they be captured or how would they ideally be captured in these surveys? Yeah, I, there, there's a bit of a debate about whether they should, those folks should be included, whether it's labor income or capital income or so forth. Um, the survey questions that we're asking on Gallup and that, that um, uh, uh, that the CPS does are, have a framework of one week. Do, what did you do in the last week? So if you were to ask that sort of question, if you were to include that sort of activity, you wouldn't pick up very many people who were doing it very occasionally. You know, um, Should it be captured uh, in any way? If it's an importance, do we, what do we want to measure? Do we want to measure labor income? in our surveys, and then we can have a lot of debate about how much labor goes into renting your apartment, or do we want to measure sources of income that people have um, that may have some labor component? That's uh, th not settled, <laughs> but, but, I, but I think that, that we probably want to include, at least to some degree, the latter. But that's being debated. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to really quickly put a measurement question to each of you. Um, so Susan, I think you're getting, if I'm remembering what we get from the CPS correctly, you're getting in the other two surveys um, an, a share of workers with kind of some informal arrangement, some multiple job holding that's two to two and a half times as high as what we get in the CPS. But we don't know a lot about whether that's different than in the past, right? From that, we learn that the CPS misses a bunch of this stuff. How has this changed over yeah. time? Wonder if you have any insight into how we can get at that time trend, maybe time use surveys, I don't know. Um, and then to Bill, a measurement question is, there's, um, I think, some new advocacy around distributional national accounts. And um, I think if one were to 
decide to take action on inequality. Um, as we heard in the conversation yesterday, there's actually many dimensions of inequality. Which one would you want to be targeting? Which one would you like to see measured? Great. Well, let me quickly on uh, time series. That's tricky. But the, you're right, the American time use survey might be used for that purpose. I might also add that the American time use survey has a double rate of multiple job holding than the CPS does from whose sample it's, it's drawn. And um, uh, a recent article kind of went in and found some additional work activities that might be missed in the CPS. One could certainly look at that survey I'm, I'm not aware of others, but could certainly look at that survey where they're really trying to get at a, at a granular level um, the, you know, uh, your work, your activities um, comprehensively and sort of see if there's any kind of trend since it was first initiated, which I think was in the 1990s sometime. So it's not a particularly long series, but you, you could probably do that. So I think the distribution accounts would be very helpful for understanding the reasons why inequality may hurt growth. Uh, and I do suspect, in particular, uh, human capital is a component. But um, I think I would be concentrating on share of income at the top because of the distortionary effects that has on consumption. Uh, because in the case of the US now, over half the housing market is the top 10% of the income distribution. Over half educational expenditures is the top 10% of the income distribution. Mm -hmm. so, so that shapes the price because you just shape the market. And, and therefore, I think um, we can see the linkages to housing construction being lower than what we would think given a tight labor market, is clearly the case with auto sales. It's quite astounding that with this level of unemployment and this length of an expansion, that Americans went heavily in debt with autos. Auto loan debt went straight up through the roof. Rather incredible for an expansion that had such a low level of unemployment, and especially an expansion in construction given that trucks are the number one selling vehicle in the United States. So all of this points to me that when you when you concentrate on inequality, you see the sicknesses showing up. Um, so uh, the IMF concentrated much more on income at the top 20 percent. The OECD did the Gini coefficient. I don't, just don't think there's enough variation in the Gini coefficient to get at these issues or to understand the shape. Um, I would concentrate more on how much is going to the top because I also suspect more of that is rent seeking. And, and, and this disappearance of the labor share, I do not think is just simply going to capital because it's, we're paying robots. I, I don't think this is the robots being paid. Hi, a uh, question for Bill. So it seems like the uh, premise of a lot of this work, you know, the OECD and the IMF is doing, you know, it shows that um, inequality can hurt growth. So therefore, um, you know, we must care about inequality because it hurts growth. Um, on the other hand, it seems like a lot of Fed officials would say, you know, the best we can do uh, to alleviate some of these inequality problems is to, you know, promote the, you know, highest growth rates we can because that's going to be the best solution to solving inequality. And I think you echoed some of those comments as well in your presentation. So it seems like there's a bit of a, you know, circular reasoning going on here. And I think that raises a question of, you know, what is the utility of either of these premises, let alone both of them uh, taken together? So, I mean, my, my interpretation of the rising inequality, and I think it's a question, uh, is this sneaky correlation between what I'm calling the financial, and other people call the financialization of the economy, which the Fed could put brakes on. And if it's rent seeking and people taking money off the top before we do the distribution to capital and labor, that's a problem. And that's something the Fed can address. Uh, if 
the growth and inequality is being generated by other forces, then I think the Fed doesn't have a direct set of tools. It's best is to not exacerbate inequality. And I think this conference was very helpful for the Fed to understand in what aspects do um, slack labor markets exacerbate inequality. So the Fed, when they balance fears of inflation and cost of inflation versus um, the cost of not being at maximum employment, the Fed can understand. And I know that this exacerbates inequality. So that's another feather <laughs> to put on, or I think it's a brick, <laughs> to put on the scales of why you want maximum employment. Last question. Um, I have a question for each of you, if that's OK. Uh, Mr. Spriggs, um, it seems to me that a, a natural condition um, of capitalism is a certain amount of inequality. Is there a 98.6 body temperature that, you yeah. know, in the Gini coefficient that we would regard, um, you know, as natural? And if so, wouldn't it be more proper to say we're at an unhealthy inequality condition as opposed to having an inequality problem? Um, and then for Ms. Hausman, I'd, I'd just like to ask, uh, I think there's a certain segment of uh, workers that, are, that you're not considering, and that's the, the person that's spending money and working hard uh, with uh, the expectation of future income. In other words, the entrepreneur uh, registered business since 1980 when this uh, income disparity issue has really you know, s begun the number of new businesses started is less than half of what it was in 1980, and the trend continues downward, fewer and fewer businesses. And of course, when you're starting a business, um, that's different than being an independent contractor or whatever. You're, you're really creating an asset at that point. So I, I'm suggesting that both the, the Fed and you might be interested in, quote unquote, the entrepreneur who is expecting future income as well. So I'm going to piggyback on your last comment for why I think, yes, there is, there is a tipping point in my view, which points to the difficulty of Mexico and Turkey in developing. Because once you reach a certain level of inequality, it's very hard to imagine how do you undo it? And how do you actually create that um, equal growth? And how do you actually um, get a strong middle class, which I think is directly related to one of the indicators of why inequality of this level hurts that the IMF and the OECD did not address. And that is new firm formation. I do not think this is at all unrelated. If you look in the US, when new firm formation picked up out of the downturn, it was when we finally saw broad-based growth at the bottom. And it's for the reasons that I laid out. You can't start a new business if I don't see the customer base growing. And if you have high levels of inequality, you got 80% of economic activity with no new customers. If I live in a country like the US used to be, where everybody is growing, the customer base is growing huge, right? It's, it's all 185 million households. That's what we used to have. If I want to start a new business, I have to, it's not a zero sum game, right? There are 185 million new customers for all of us. I have to pick them out, get my segment. If the new customer base isn't growing, it is a zero-sum game. The only way I can grow, I have to steal your customers. That's a different problem, and it's a huge problem. That's harder to overcome. Yes, thank you. Um, so obviously the, the work that I was just um, you know, referring to was focused on the what, you know, in, in, in statistical agency terms would be the you know unincorporated self-employed right people who are not starting their own business by and large or think of themselves as starting their own business um, and that's a sort of parallel and interesting problem that you raise which is is the um, you know this appears to be growing it certainly appears to be growing in, in tax data the declared stuff and uh, the other um, you know you're uh, is perhaps shrinking. There's a really interesting study, I don't know if you've seen it, coming out of the Federal Reserve Board uh, 
um, by Emily Jackson, uh, Adam Looney, and Shanti Ramnath, who used tax data to look at the growth over time. I'm thinking it was from the 1980s, uh, sorry, 90s to the present, and showed a substantial growth in self-employment, right? But it looked like virtually all of that was coming from people who would be unincorporated self-employed, not from the other. Yeah. So. Okay. Great. We, Thank you. Thank you very much, our speakers.